Good morning, everyone. It is uh, well, 10.01 now. We can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Hagerman Second Saturday um, for March. Um, and I will just turn it over to Susan. Uh, Susan, no Susan Knowles is going to be hosting and introducing uh, Wayne. So uh, Susan, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Robert. I would like to uh, introduce Wayne Meyer. He is a true friend of Hagerman. Uh, he has devoted many years and a whole lot of time to Hagerman Wildlife Refuge. He does research out there, uh, mainly on uh, painted buntings. He uh, birds out there once a week with Jack Childs. He has been on the programs committee since I've been there at uh, 2006. And he is an exceptional birder starting at age 11 and traveling practically all over the world to bird. So today he's gonna to be talking about bird migration. And I'd, Wayne, it's up to you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a very strange experience. Um, if I don't know what they've told you, my computer refuses to, to share sound with me. So I'm told you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Uh, very weird. Anyway, let's get started here. Um, oh, where'd my presentation go? Uh, hang on a second, folks. No, no. I made the mistake of restarting the computer to try to get the sound to work. And of course that dropped my file. Here we go. Okay, now back to Zoom, share, there it is, yes. Okay. So what I wanna to do today is to talk about bird migration. I did this talk several years ago. It hasn't changed very much. I apologize for that. But uh, this time of year, it's usually a really good thing to talk about migration because it's just about to start. In fact, it has started. If any of you have been looking at the messages coming from Jack Childs on his Tuesday morning censuses, the cinnamon teals have started to show up. Uh, I don't think the blue winged teals have showed up yet, but a few other birds should be showing up. And I'm really kind of surprised that the white-eyed vireos have not. But anyway, let's talk about bird migration. There are some very ancient ideas about bird migration. Uh, perhaps one of the oldest ones that we can find written down is that the ancient Celts believed that the souls of the dead were carried to the moon on the backs of geese. Uh, this actually probably comes from seeing geese during migration at night flying wow. in front of the moon, like in this picture here, uh, to explain why they would have thought that. So that wasn't really about migration, although in order to see it, they almost certainly would have been during migration. Aristotle had an interesting idea about migration as well. He noticed that there were no swallows around in the winter, but then in the spring, he would see scenes like this, where a whole bunch of swallows are out collecting mud from a marsh somewhere. Now we know that these are cliff swallows and that they are going to be using that mud to build their nests. But Aristotle got the crazy idea 
that these birds were hibernating in the mud over the winter. And the reason you were seeing them all of a sudden in the spring was they had just climbed out of the mud and we're getting ready to go fly around and catch some bugs. There are some other wacko ideas about bird migration. In Northern Europe, during the Middle Ages, people noticed that barnacle goose, the bird on the left here, were not present during the winter, but they were present during the summer when they were breeding. But if you went to the coast, you could see these barnacle or these goose barnacles are sometimes called gooseneck barnacles that looked kind of like barnacle geese. They've got long black necks. They've got a white shell that kind of resembles the head on the goose. And so the somewhat bizarre idea was formed that the barnacle was the overwintering form of the organism and the barnacle goose was the summering breeding form of the organism. So somehow barnacles transmuted into geese to explain why the geese were only there part of the year. Well, our modern understanding of migration is a little different. Migration is defined as a seasonal movement of an animal between two or more widely separate areas where it spends some time. Now, widely separated, how far is that? We generally say more than 250 miles. Uh, for birds, at least, 200 miles is easy range to just fly in one day. So they might be searching for food and go that far. But if they go more than 250 miles, then that's probably not just searching for food. Spending time means that the animal has to set up a home base. They have to operate from a fixed location. They're not just wandering about. Um, and then seasonal is really important too. It happens at the same time every year. Now, botanists use the term migration very differently. When they talk about migration, they're really talking about range expansion or range change. So plants change where they grow by slowly spreading. That's not the sense of migration that we ornithologists would use. When we talk about migrants and migration, there are a few special words that we've developed. Resident is one of those. A resident species is an animal that stays in one place all year round. So for instance, this picture of a black capped chickadee or here in Texas, a Carolina chickadee. These are birds that stay in the same location all year. They're here in the summer, they're here in the winter and anything in between. Uh, the advantage to being a resident is you get to know your territory very, very well. Um, you can find food, you know exactly where to go. It's not hard to find it, it's because you know where it is. Uh, residents rarely need to fight over territories because they're in their territory, they stay there all year round. Nobody ever really challenges them very much. The big problem with being a resident is that you must be able to find enough food during the scarce time of year. Knowing where the food is doesn't help you if you know that it's not there right now. So uh, resident birds have to be pretty tough. They have to be able to make it through either the dry season or the cold season when there's not a lot of food available. Now, there are other birds that <clears throat> kind of don't fit that definition of migration. And these birds are sometimes referred to as nomads. So for instance, here we have a Hermans gull. Hermans gull breeds on just a few islands off of Baja, California, Isla Rasa being the biggest one. And there may be 10,000 birds or more on that island during the breeding season. But then 
when you have that many birds all located in one small area, they eat up the food pretty quickly. So they need to leave the islands and they need to spread out during the rest of the year. Now, in the case of Hermon's gull, they breed in the Sea of Cortez and the islands off of Baja. And then they spread all the way south to Panama and all the way north to the Washington Canada border. Sometimes they do even show up in British Columbia. So they travel long distances. That's more than 250 kilometers, but they're not predictable. That doesn't happen the same every year. One year, one bird may decide to go spend some time around San Francisco. The next year, that same bird may decide to go spend some time around Yucatan, or they may go all the way to Panama, or they go up to Oregon. Uh, it's different every year. And one of the things about nomads is they are rarely territorial. Uh, other than their own nest space on the island where they breed, they really don't defend any kind of territory. They don't drive off any others of the same species. There is a special kind of migration called eruption. Eruptive birds show up in large numbers, but only every few years. So the prime example is the snowy owl. We know that snowy owls every five or six years will make major movements out of the boreal forest down even as far as Texas in the winter. Some of you may recall there was a uh, snowy owl that landed on a parking lot out by Lake Ray Roberts and was there pretty much all season. That same year, there was another one that decided to spend its time at a construction site in Oklahoma City on a, a skyscraper that was being built. There was another one that same year that showed up in Wichita Falls. Eruptions are mostly happening from birds that spend most of their time in either the high Arctic or the boreal forests of Canada. And it's generally believed that eruption cycles correspond to food crashes. So the, the classical story about the snowy owl is they feed on lemmings. Lemmings have population cycles where they'll build up for a few years and then they crash. And supposedly when they crash is when the snowy owls leave searching for food and they end up going farther south than normal. Uh, I recently read a paper that says, this is actually not true. The uh, birds that fly the farthest south during eruptions are juveniles. They are well-fed. And so it may actually be that these eruptions happen when there's a good lemming year and lots and lots of juvenile owls survive the summer and they don't have enough territory for the winter. And so they spread out and come down uh, into the United States more. There are lots of eruptive species. Crossbills, both red crossbills and white wing crossbills are known to erupt. The winter finches, uh, purple finch for instance, every so often we have a really good purple finch year at the refuge. This year we didn't see a single purple finch at all. Um, pine grosbeaks, evening grosbeaks, a bunch of different birds will be eruptive and they will occasionally move far south. Now, when we talk about migration, we're used to thinking about birds going north and south, going north for the summer and south for the winter. Uh, in fact, if you live south of the equator, you know that most birds go south for the summer and north for the winter. And it's also the case that some birds will travel east and west. They don't go south at all. For instance, this spotted owl, uh, we took a picture of this back in the 1980s. This was an owl that had spent all winter in the backyard of a house in Sacramento. And the California Fish and Game Department were becoming worried because the owl wouldn't leave in the spring. 
And so they started telling people where it was. So people, of course, flocked to it and took lots of pictures of it. And yeah, guess what? Within two weeks, that owl had decided to migrate. Uh, it probably would have left on its own anyway. But with the spotted owl, they do altitudinal migration. So in the summer, they're living up on the high peaks of the Sierra Nevadas. And at least in California, on the winter, they're moving west into the low country of the California Central Valley and the foothills. And then come spring again, they will fly back east up into the mountains to breed. So it's true that many birds go north for the summer and south for the winter, at least here in North America, but it's not true for all of them. Now, seasonality, as I said before, means that birds go to the same places every year, which means we can learn where to expect them to show up and we can get ready for them and go watch them. For instance, this is a picture of a broad-winged hawk. Broad-winged hawks tend to travel in huge, huge numbers. When they migrate, they may migrate in flocks of a thousand or more birds. There are hawk watch sites scattered all over the country in that map, all those little red squares are famous hawk watch locations. And uh, people will go to these locations during the right time of year, hoping to see lots and lots of broadwing hawks. So, for instance, six that's Anno, excuse me, that's um, uh, out around Houston on the upper Texas coast. Five that's around Victoria, that's probably uh, Anoak. And these are places where, on the right day, you can see well over a thousand broad-winged hawks. Now, when they're breeding, they spread out. They don't like a lot of neighbors because a lot of neighbors means a lot of competition for food. But when they migrate, they tend to all gather up together and go to predictable places. Now, there are some birds that we might call super migrants. Uh, we can't really correctly call them migrants at all because while they move very, very long distances, they're not doing it in a proper seasonal pattern, although they will be predictably in one place at one time of the year. So for instance, albatrosses. If I remember right, this is a photograph of waved albatrosses who breed in the Chatham Islands of Polynesia down around uh, New Zealand. And when their young hatch, they will sit around on the island for a, a month or two. The parents will abandon them. And eventually they get so hungry, they have to leave. And they will fly northwest toward Papua New Guinea, and then up to Japan, and then across the Northern Pacific and the Aleutian Islands, down the Pacific coast of North America, and then turn and head back to Polynesia. Well, the young birds, when they leave, follow that exact same route, we think, but they may not come to land at all for five years. We know they don't try to breed until they're at least five years old. So that means they leave the Chatham Islands and fly around and around and around the Pacific at least five times following the prey that becomes available at the right season of the year, but they are super migrants in that they don't ever touch ground for five years. Pretty, pretty amazing. One thing we do know about migrating birds is they tend to migrate to similar places at either end of their travels. So for instance, here is an American golden plover. In the map, you can see that the American golden plover spends the non-breeding our winter down in mostly Argentina in the Pampas. And then that's summer down there. 
They then turn around and come back up to North America for our summer, and they breed up in the high Arctic along Canada and Alaska. The upper picture is a picture of the Brooks Range in Alaska. You see there's tall mountains, there's some snow covered peaks, but down in the flats, there's shallow lakes and a lot of grasses. Okay, that's the habitat where the American golden plover breeds. The lower picture is a photo from somewhere in Patagonia. I'm not exactly sure where, but you can see we have high mountains, we have snow, and then we have flat and shallow water and a lot of grasses. So these birds, when they travel, are traveling from a place that is very much like the place they're going to, and they spend most of their time in very similar habitats. Now, not necessarily true of everybody, but almost everybody. So here's another example. This is the hooded warbler. This is a bird that we have here in Texas. Every once in a while, we find them at Hagerman National Wildlife Refuge, but mostly they breed farther east. So if you go to Tyler or points east, you're likely to find hooded warblers. The upper picture shows you a nice wooded forest. That one is in Louisiana. I forget again where exactly, uh, but you can see that it's a fairly dense closed canopy forest. There's a moderate amount of undergrowth and that's ideal habitat for hooded warblers when they breed. The lower photograph, is from a rainforest in Costa Rica, which is where these hooded warblers spend the winter. And okay, it's not exactly the same, the plants are different, but it's a similar structure. They've got a closed canopy forest with a moderate amount of understory. It's not real tightly closed in. It's ideal habitat. And so they spend all their time there. All right, so let's talk about why birds go to all the trouble to migrate and travel these huge distances. First advantage to being a migrant is you get to avoid harsh weather. Here's a snowy, a snow bunting in obviously a snowy field. Uh, I can't actually tell from the plumage if this is summer or winter. So I don't know if this is a bird on the Connecticut coast in December where I used to see them when I lived there or if this is a bird from the high Arctic in Alaska and Canada. But I do know, just by looking at it, that there's not a whole lot of snow on the ground. And so he's still able to find food. If he stayed in Alaska all year round, he'd have six or eight months of deep snow cover where he couldn't find any food. So he has to fly away, fly south for the winter. He may not leave the snow, but he does fly away. Another advantage to being a migrant is if you go farther away from the equator during the summer, the days get longer and longer days mean more time to find food. So you can find more food, which means you can feed more babies. All right, evolution works by favoring those animals which are able to pass on copies of their genes in a larger percentage to the next generation. And so it's an advantage for a migrant to fly north in the summer where there's a lot of food and a lot of time to find that food so that you can make a lot of babies. Uh, being a migrant also means you get to avoid competition with the residents. So that hooded warbler who flew to Costa Rica, well, he won't see this particular species of toucan, but he probably has to compete with a lot of different tropical birds that stay put all year round. And being residents, they probably know the territory really well and can get to the food resources in a timely manner. So if you fly away and spend the summer up north, those residents aren't going to follow you. And so you don't have to compete with them. Another big advantage to being a migrant, something that people often don't think about, is that you can reduce your parasite load. Uh, the brown thing there is a feather louse. The big gray thing is a bot fly. Uh, feather lice eat feathers, which can cause rapid feather wear. 
is a problem if you fly. And bot flies are these disgusting animals that lay their eggs in the chicks that hatch and then the little larva grows and eats some of their tissue under their skin. You can find bluebirds with loads of bot flies uh, and it can actually slow down their growth. Although apparently they uh, recover from the bot flies once the larvae, um, um, once the larvae become adults, but it's unpleasant. Well, if you move every six months and you're not in that location for six whole months, that means that your parasites have got to either figure out a way to, to catch a ride and stay on you, or they have to find a way to hibernate for six months until you come back and they can eat you again. So uh, we're pretty sure that many migratory birds have reduced parasite loads because of their travel. Okay, so lots of good things about migration. There are some bad things too. Migrants have to face unpredictable conditions. The map there shows you Wrangell Island, which is just off the coast of um, Bering Sea, Russia. There are some 100 plus thousand snow geese that nest on Wrangell Island. But the problem is Wrangell Island only has about 45 days per year where there's no snow. So the snow geese that nest on Wrangell Island actually arrive in late May before the snow has melted. They have to scrape the snow off of the vegetation so they can build their little nests, lay their eggs, and then they're going to sit on those eggs and incubate them for about 28 days. Hopefully by the time the eggs hatch, the snow has melted and there's food available to feed the chicks. But some years there isn't, and some years the entire population fails to breed and they give up early and have to leave. Even if they're successful and they raise chicks, they've only got about 45 days for those chicks to grow to full size and fly away for the winter, which they usually spend in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. The other picture of the ducks is a rather famous story from back in the 1980s of a group of about 200 mallards flew to Chicago. And it was mid-April, early May, I can't remember which. And there was a freak cold snap, much like what we're having right now. And the lakes all froze up and these mallards arrived in Chicago and couldn't eat. There was no, no open water for them. So they had to turn around and fly 150 miles south in order to find open water and feed and then stayed there for about a week trying to fatten up again before they tried to once again travel north to Chicago. So unpredictable conditions are a problem that migrants have to be able to cope with. There are also a lot of hazards to being a migrant. You may recognize this skyline. Um, big cities at night tend to light up and this causes a problem for birds. It's been estimated that up to 56 million birds die every year by crashing into buildings. And it turns out that if you light the buildings, you think, well, now the bird can see the building, it won't hit it. No, the bird sees light and doesn't know what to make of it because it's nighttime and there shouldn't be light. And so it goes over to investigate. And so actually lighting up your buildings is a bad idea. Recently, several cities and Dallas is one of them have decided that they're going to have lights out nights during peak migration period. So there will be a few nights every year where the city will encourage everybody to turn off the outside lights in their buildings so that they don't have as many birds crashing into them. Of course, it's not perfect because you've got to have lights on inside and you have windows. Birds can see the light through the windows. <coughs> they may even think they can just fly through the windows uh, so we still have problems, but it's 
slightly better than it used to be. And there are not just man-made hazards, there are natural hazards to migration. So here is a picture of Eleonora's falcon. This is a falcon that breeds in the Mediterranean. It breeds on the coasts and on the small islands all over the Mediterranean Ocean. And unlike almost every other falcon in the world, Eleonora's falcon does not breed until October. The reason for that is in October, all the not yet one-year-old birds that hatched out during the summer are going to migrate south to get away from the bad weather in the winter. And so Eleonora's falcon has loads and loads of stupid, inexperienced, baby, almost baby birds to feed their chicks. And so October actually brings them more food than any other time of the year. Another disadvantage to migration, to migrating is that it is energetically very expensive. The picture on the left shows a fat pad. So what someone has done, they've caught a bird and they're blowing on the feathers of the breast to expose the skin underneath. And you can see there's a big old fat pad above that uh, flight muscle. That actually looks like a big old flight fat pad, but it's a small old flight pad, fat pad. This bird needs to eat some more before it can migrate. Uh, small birds will eat their entire weight in food before attempting to migrate. So they will put on, a five ground bird may put on as much as five grams of fat as an energy source so that they can fly all day long or actually all night long and use up that fat to keep them up in the air. Um, the hummingbird is another example. We know that hummingbirds only migrate during the day because they need to have nectar. They will drink more than their own body weight in nectar each day that they are migrating long distances. So they, it costs a lot of energy to fly that far. So those are the pluses and the minuses to being a migrant. What kinds of migrants are there? Well, there are many birds that migrate during the daytime. We call those diurnal migrants. Uh, one example of diurnal migration is swifts and swallows. Uh, they catch food that's flying. They catch food mostly by seeing it. And so flying during the day is fine for them. Uh, in fact, when they migrate, they just behave like normal, except they keep flying south. They don't turn around and go back. As I said before, hummingbirds, they need to have nectar. They need the sun out. They need the flowers to be making lots and lots of sugar so that they can have lots and lots of energy to fly. And hummingbirds are really, really grateful when they find your backyard is full of hummingbird flowers, especially in October when they are flying south and looking for food. Another group of birds that are diurnal, are diurnal migrants are a lot of the big raptors and other soaring birds. These birds are saving energy by not flapping, right? They're going to soar, which means you put your wings out and you, you generate lift and you slowly, slowly fall back down toward the ground. And eventually you may have to start flapping again, but hopefully you don't have to flap. If all you have to do is hold your wings out, that doesn't take much energy. So they're looking for thermals. They're looking for either rising columns of hot air or bubbles of hot air. And these thermals are created by all kinds of things. Uh, parking lots are great generators of thermals because they're black and they absorb sunlight much faster than the green areas around them. And so they heat up. And so the air over the parking lot heats up and as hot air is less dense, it rises, which sucks new air in at the bottom and the hot air goes up. And so when a bird finds one of these thermals, 
they can circle around inside the rising hot air and gain altitude without having to flap. Right? When you see a bunch of vultures and they're all circling, right? popular myth says, oh, they found something to eat and they're circling around it before they go down to eat it. No, almost never. If a vulture finds something to eat, it goes straight down as fast as it can because it wants to get there before other vultures find it. When you see things circling, what they're doing is they're riding in these thermals and they're trying to gain altitude. Uh, mountains are also another good source of rising air. In this case, it's not thermals, but the wind hits the mountains and goes up. And so that will also create rising air that the soaring birds can follow. And so uh, if you looked at those hawk watch sites, several of those are located near mountains where the birds are catching rising air. Diurnal uh, migrating birds often use visual landmarks. So the photo of the lighthouse there, that's the Pigeon Point Lighthouse in central California. And in the far distance, you can see some land rising out of the ocean. That's Point Reyes Peninsula, just north of San Francisco. Uh, Pigeon Point Lighthouse is a very famous place to go during migration to see huge numbers of migrating birds, mostly sooty shearwaters, like the photo on the left. Um, that's not the photo I took. I wish I had seen that many sooty shearwaters when I went to Pigeon Point, but I was at Pigeon Point one day during migration, and we were watching about 1,000 shearwaters per hour flying by the lighthouse. Why? Because when they left the area of Point Reyes, they looked across Monterey Bay. The other end of Monterey Bay is Pigeon Point, and so the birds head from Point Reyes. Visually, they can see Pigeon Point and they head that way so they know they're not going to get lost. And they come in the hundreds of thousands. It's truly amazing. Not all birds migrate during the day. There are a lot of birds that are nocturnal migrants. In fact, many small passerines, the small songbirds like the warblers, are going to migrate during the night. Why? Well, in part because they need to spend all day catching caterpillars and other things to eat so they can store up enough fat to have the energy to fly all night long. They typically fly for about eight hours a night, come down, and they're looking for a good place with a lot of vegetation that will have a lot of food in it, and then they'll spend all day in that location. So some of the big migrant traps in Texas, for instance, High Island and some of the other um, Boy Scout woods, et cetera, <coughs> excuse me, mm. these migrant traps are places where you have some trees where there aren't a lot of trees around them. In Dallas, there are several parks like Spring Creek Park in Garland, Spring Creek Park in Richardson and Prairie Creek Park on the Richardson-Dallas border, where you have clusters of trees with not a lot of trees around them. They attract a lot of migrants. So these small nocturnal migrants are gonna look for places where they can feed all day long and store up lots and lots of fat so that they can then have energy to fly all night. Another advantage to being a nocturnal migrant is that you can avoid predation by visual predators. Here's some goshawks. Goshawks catch little birds and feed them to their chicks. Uh, mostly they are visual hunters. So they are out and active during the day. If you stay in the trees and hide during the day while you're trying to stuff your face and then fly at night, the goshawk can't come find you. I'm sorry, that's not a goshawk, it's a jeer falcon. Night is also a good time to fly because the sky is cooler and generally calmer. If the sun's not out, there are less thermals creating um, um, uneven airflow. So there's less, uh, I can't bring the word up. Anyway, 
it's smoother flying. And it's cool. When you fly for hours at a time, you generate a whole lot of heat. And so being able to cool off is also important. And if you're a nocturnal migrator, you can navigate by the stars. You can look at the sky, see the stars, and the stars are in a very predictable place every time of the year. Right? We know there are spring uh, constellations, there are fall constellations. So if you recognize patterns in the stars, you can figure out which direction you're going. Okay, that's a little more complicated. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. Shorebirds are neither nocturnal nor diurnal. Uh, they need to be in places where there's low tide to find food. And then during periods when there's high tide, that's when they travel. But the tides have a roughly 25 hour cycle. So that means every day they're gonna start flying around an hour later and they're gonna start feeding around an hour later. So sometimes they're flying during the day, sometimes they're feeding during the day. It all depends on the tides. Where do birds migrate? Well, in North America, there are four main uh, areas where the birds migrate. We call these things flyways. On the Atlantic coast, birds will fly up the Atlantic coast and then out into Canada. In the fall, they'll come back from Canada and head towards Maine mostly. And once the interesting thing is in the, May, in the fall, some of the birds will fly straight out southeast from Maine, depending on trade winds to push them back towards the west. So they will fly out over the ocean and make landfall in the greater Antilles. That means they have to fly nonstop over water. They can't get any food. They're depending on those winds. But in the fall, those winds are extremely reliable. Uh, otherwise, a lot of the birds don't do that. They follow the coast. And they can go up or down the coast pretty well. The Mississippi River also provides a great corridor for birds to migrate. It's a huge river. It's easy to see from almost anywhere close by. And because it has a floodplain, there are a lot of trees around it that haven't gotten cut down by people building houses. At least not yet. That tends to be changing. <coughs> but hopefully that trend will stop because we are finding out that it's really, really expensive to keep rebuilding houses every couple of years when it floods. Uh, they then follow several other rivers. You can see the Ohio River, the Missouri River, and, and several other rivers are big major migration routes for the Mississippi Flyway. Then there's the Pacific Flyway. As you might guess, those birds are following the Pacific Coast. Again, great landmark. It's really easy to see the difference between sky or between land and water. And you tend to find lots of salt marshes and other places where there's good food, excuse me, good food, food supply. Uh, the, Pacific Flyway also has a, a side branch of birds that follow the Sierra Nevada mountains. And as I said before, the wind, as it hits those mountains, causes rising air. And so these birds are getting free lift by going over the mountains. It's not quite as good a landmark, but it's free. It saves energy. It's worth doing. Then you have the area where we live, the central flyway. Uh, birds come up through Central America mostly, although a few birds will fly across the Gulf of Mexico from the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula to Texas. And then they're going to fly up through the western part of the Great Plains and spread out once they reach Canada and Alaska. Um, in this flyway, again, they're using the Rocky Mountains to provide lift, which is a little weird because they're usually flying on the east side of the mountains and the wind is blowing from the west, so the wind is not rising on the east side of the mountains. But as the wind rises over the mountains, it then comes down and it hits the ground and kind of bounces up. So there's an area just east of the mountains where you get lift again from this 
recoiling air. All right, how do birds migrate? Well, we know that they tell time by measuring the number of hours of light in a day. If you live right on the equator, that doesn't work very well. Most days are 12 hours long and the nights are 12 hours long and it doesn't really change much from year to year or from month to month. But anywhere else in the world, you get longer and shorter days as the year goes by. And so birds are able to tell how many hours of light there are in a day. So when the number of hours of light in the day approaches roughly 12 hours, that's when they get ready to start migrating and they undergo a bunch of physiological changes. They start eating and eating and eating. We call this hyperphagia. Here are some pictures of birds eating. Uh, the secretary bird is probably not getting ready to migrate because it's a resident, but it's a great picture of a bird eating. So why not? Um, as I said before, these birds need to put on a lot of fat in order to migrate. And so they eat far more than they usually do. They also start staging. Here are a bunch of, you know, it looks like maybe European starlings. Maybe it's blackbirds, I'm not sure. All gathering up together prior to migration. And lots of birds do this. Out at Hagerman, it's very common to see purple martins gathering up on the power lines in August. They're getting ready to migrate. They're gathering up. There's safety in numbers. If you're gonna be flying all day long, it would be nice to be in a bunch of other birds who also know where they're going. So in case you get lost, you can follow them. And the more eyeballs you have, the less chance a predator has of sneaking up on you and killing anybody. So gathering up in large numbers makes sense. Those of you who live here in Sherman and Denison will no doubt have seen great-tailed grackles gathering in huge numbers on the power lines by uh, the intersection of Highway 82 and Highway 75 in December. They're not staging. What they're doing is they're night roosting. They're gone out during the day. Maybe they didn't find any food. They all gather up at night and then they look for other birds that look like they found food. And if you didn't find food today, you're gonna to follow somebody who looks like he found food yesterday and you're gonna follow him and hopefully he will lead you to food. And so that's what our grackles are doing in the winter. They're not staging, but they're looking for, for information about food. And of course, there's a lot of grocery stores around that area, so they're finding a lot of um, dumpster food. There's also a fancy word from German, Zuganruhe, which means seasonal restlessness. When migrating birds start staging, they start getting restless and they start flying around and you'll see big flocks of these birds kind of just circling around and coming back and landing on the same place, right? They're getting ready to migrate. They feel the urge to be flying and to move, but maybe they haven't stored up enough energy supplies yet, or maybe it's just not quite right, the, the right time of year yet. And so they're getting ready, they're getting restless, but they're not actually going anywhere yet. Well, how do we know all of this about migration? Well, there are a couple of different um, ways of studying migration. This gentleman is Steve Emlin of Cornell University. Uh, when he was doing his doctoral dissertation, he wanted to learn how do birds migrate? How do they navigate? How do they know where to go? And so he made these special cages. There is a cone with a wire screen on top the bird can see the sky out there, but he can't escape. On the bottom, there's an ink pad. So every time the bird lands, he puts ink on his toes. And then anytime the bird tries to jump and start flying, he's going to hit the paper cone and leave ink behind. <coughs> and so Emlyn was able to figure out which direction the bird moved. And in fact, when he put them outdoors at the right time of year, it was time for spring migration. They all tended to hop north or northeast. So great. Now he takes these birds and puts them indoors in a planetarium. 
In a planetarium, you can imitate the night sky and you can turn lights on and turn lights off. You can make things move. You have great control over the sky. And what Amlin eventually was able to show was that the birds did in fact navigate using the stars. And the way they could tell where north was, was they looked at the sky and they found the part of the sky that did not move very much over a night. Remember, because the earth rotates, the sky appears to rotate to an observer on the earth. And so uh, Polaris, the north star, hardly moves at all. The Little Dipper just moves a little. The Big Dipper is a little farther out. It moves a whole lot more. And then some of the other constellations rise up above the horizon and fall back down below the horizon. And those are probably not as reliable because you can't see them all the time. Well, Emlyn was able to show that it didn't matter what star you used, but the birds would look for the part of the sky where there's very little movement, and that's going to be north. So he was able to rotate the planetarium sky around Betelgeuse, and the birds all changed from migrating towards Polaris to migrating towards Betelgeuse. Okay, why would birds do that? Well, it turns out that the North Star, Polaris, is only over the North Pole for oh, maybe 10,000 years or so. And because of the way the Earth moves, the sky moves very, very, very slowly. And so over several millions of years, different stars have been the North Star. So for the birds, it would not have been a good idea to recognize a particular star, but instead to recognize the star that everything rotates around, that's North, and then you can figure out how to move. A lot of our, our understanding of migration comes from people like Sidney Gothrow, who uh, works in Southern Louisiana, Sydney had a great realization one day. He realized that a bird is essentially a gigantic raindrop, right? Our bodies are roughly 70% water, so are birds. So when a bird is flying, it's like this giant raindrop. Well, we have these things called weather radar that are able to detect the presence of water in the atmosphere. So Sydney's got the great idea, why don't I use weather radar? to study bird migration. So he first got an old surplus World War II weather radar and was able to, yes, find the birds. And eventually he got to the point where he worked with the US Weather Service and used all their fancy Doppler radars, et cetera, et cetera. So we know a ton about birds that migrate, especially the ones that migrate across the Gulf of Mexico because we can track them with weather radar. You can also learn about where birds are at different times of year by looking at their feathers. And it's not by looking, just looking at the feathers, but actually by analyzing stable isotopes. So it turns out oxygen and hydrogen have many different isotopes. There's oxygen 16, oxygen 18, hydrogen one, hydrogen two, hydrogen three. And some of those are not radioactive. They're stable. And the advantage to that is wherever a feather grew, that feather will retain the stable isotope signature of the place where the feather grew. So for instance, my painted buntings every October or every August and September fly to New Mexico and Arizona for a molt migration. They then grow new feathers before they fly south into Mexico. So if we collected their feathers and analyzed their stable isotopes, we would be able to identify that they spent their feather regrowth time of the year in Arizona and New Mexico. And you can do this with almost any location in the world. So you can figure out where did the birds grow their feathers. It's not telling you everywhere else in between they've been, but it's at least giving you some information that otherwise you didn't have. Well, what about trying to follow everywhere else in between? Um, almost 20 years ago now, ornithologists developed small 
radio transceivers that could talk to satellites in orbit. And you could put these transceivers onto large birds. They had to be pretty large birds because the transceiver was pretty big. And they could talk to the satellite and then you could communicate with the satellite and get data from those transceivers to figure out where your bird is. When we first started this, it didn't work real well. I remember going to a meeting, there was a person who was studying ospreys and they had put satellite trackers on an osprey and it flew from San Diego down into Mexico. And they knew it flew into Mexico because somebody actually sighted the bird and it had distinctive tags on its legs that allowed them to know it was that individual. But the satellite program indicated that the bird was at 250 miles farther west out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which no, ospreys can't live out there. So at first, the satellite had some glitches, but it has been improved tremendously. And so now the map I'm showing you has eight or nine pallid harriers that had satellite transducers put on them in Kazakhstan. And you can see that most of them flew through Southern Europe, through Arabia and the Middle East into Africa. And then they spread out through Sub-Saharan Africa into Ethiopia. I think one of them ends up in Rwanda. A couple of them go into Chad. Uh, and then there's one, you know, there's always one, right? There's one in the purple line actually flies to India instead. <coughs> Okay, so this was great for a while, but it only worked on birds that were big enough to be able to carry the transponder. Much more recently, we have developed a, a, a miniature technology. These are devices called geolocators. They're tiny, you can see in the picture, it fits between a thumb and forefinger. And you glue these onto the skin of the bird and then there's a little stem that sticks out between the back feathers. And on the end of that stem, there's a light sensor. And what the geolocator does is it just records the light intensity every however many minutes you want to set it for. And records that, but to keep the weight down, there's no sending unit. So you have to recapture the bird in order to recover the geolocator and then download the data from it. Well, by measuring light onset and offset, you can actually calculate where the bird is that day, okay? The dawn comes at a certain time of day. Farther north, it comes earlier or later, depending on what side of the equinox we are. And the dawn comes later, the farther west you go. So you can actually use light onset and light offset to figure out latitude and longitude of these birds. It works great. Of course, the problem is uh, if you put 20 on, 20 on a bird, on, you put 20 of them on 20 different birds, you might catch five, okay? Birds die, birds get eaten, birds don't always go to the same place. So trying to catch them a year later and download and recover the geolocator is a gamble, but it has worked. Bridget Stutchbury was the first person to publish with this method. And now there are literally hundreds and hundreds of researchers using this. And because they're so small, you can work on birds down to 10 grams. They're still not quite small enough for the little tiny five gram warblers, but people are working on it. They're trying to figure out a way to make an even smaller geolocator. Um, geolocators have told us a lot. And one of the most interesting things they've told us is that the world record for longest migration does not belong to the Arctic term. Uh, I am constantly amazed that you can still look on Google and find things that say the Arctic tern has the longest migration of any bird in the world. They breed in Arctic Canada and they migrate either across Europe and Africa where they've been breeding in Scandinavia or they migrate down along the North American and South American coasts down to areas near but not quite in Antarctica. 
And they say that is a long, long trip. Uh, if you go all the way there and all the way back, it's about a 27,000 kilometer trip. And everybody just accepted that without question. And then these geolocators showed up. We've discovered that there is a species of bird called the Northern Wheat Ear. One population breeds in West Africa. Some of them, uh, or excuse me, they winter in West Africa. Some of them breed in Northern or in Western Europe or in Scandinavia, but other ones actually fly all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and breed in Arctic Canada, which we never thought anybody did. Uh, it does explain why Northern wheat ear is showing up in Canada and North America and the United States a lot more often the last 20 years or so, because that's about how long that population has been going all the way over there to Canada to breed. But the really amazing thing is there's another population that spends the winter in Kenya, flies up through Sudan, across the Arabian desert, out into Siberia, and some individuals fly all the way across the Bering Strait and breed in Alaska. And that turns out to be a 29,000 kilometer round trip. So they actually are going farther than uh, Arctic terns. And from an east-west viewpoint, it means that northern wheat ears go almost all the way around the world. There's a little gap in Africa and a little gap in Canada where you don't see northern wheat ears, but pretty much anywhere else in the world, they can be there. Okay. So that's the end of my talk. Normally I would ask for questions, but I can't hear you. So if you have any questions, why don't you type something into the chat and I'll see if I can uh, answer your question. Yes, turbulence, that was the word I was looking for back then. Uh, anybody else got any questions? You can go ahead and type them into the chat. When do birds actually sleep? That's a wonderful question. Many of them don't. Uh, we know that, for instance, those albatrosses that are out over the ocean, when they fly, one side of their brain is always awake. One side may be sleeping or it may be awake. So they trade off sides. Right side sleeps for a couple hours, left side sleeps for a couple hours, but the bird is always awake and aware, which you know, you kind of have to be when you're out there flying over the ocean, you can't afford to hit the water. Well, all right, folks. Again, I apologize for the computer glitch and not being able to hear your questions. Uh, what is your recommendation or opinion on bird mitigation programs in cities to protect? Well, uh, turning out the lights is a good thing. Providing Food in the form of green strips would be a very good thing to do. Um, cities, they're tough. You have a lot of people. Uh, it would also be very, very useful to put more habitat preserves, right? Places like Agerman National Wildlife Refuge are great places for migrants. We get thousands and thousands of shorebirds every year. Um, more of that would be good. Let's see, what other questions? Best spots to watch warbler migration in Texas. I would say the upper Texas coast is by far the best. Uh, Texas Ornithological Society has several refuge or several preserves um, whose name escaped me right now, but they're all over from say Beaumont down to Houston. And then there's also Magic Ridge, which I forget where that is. It's somewhere down the middle coast, uh, really good places. But, you know, even here in Dallas, those parks I talked about, Spring Creek, Prairie Creek, uh, there's a couple, Arapahoe Park. Those are places where during the spring, if you get there early, you have to be there really early in the morning before a lot of people disturb the birds, you can find a lot of migrants. 
Why would I see pelicans in Northwest Missouri, usually during the summer? Because they are breeding there. Uh, pelicans will breed in very small ponds or what we think of as very small ponds. So um, they're probably finding enough fish to eat and they may be breeding there. What are some of the birds we see locally that are migrating versus resident? Okay, go out birding right now. Most of the birds you see will be residents, things like cardinals, chickadees, titmice. And then there will be some migrants like um, American goldfinch. Uh, if you can find them this year, pine siskins. Uh, most of the ducks, most of the shorebirds are all migrants. During the summer, a lot of our favorite birds like the painted buntings and the indigo buntings are, are migrants. They only hear in the summer. And those same chickadees and titmice and cardinals. Uh, some of our blue jays are migrants. Some of our blue jays are, are residents. So you know, go out birding in the winter, go out birding in the summer, and you will see a lot of residents that are staying around and a lot of new migrants. It's what makes going out to the refuge every Tuesday to help Jack with the bird census so much fun and why uh, I encourage people to try to get out there and, and do it. Of course, we can't take a whole lot of people at once, but it is a lot of fun. Okay, well, thank you all very much for your kind attention. And I think it's time to turn ourselves off. I've gone a, a few minutes over at 11, but still within our time limit. And again, thank you very much. Sorry that I can't hear you. Goodbye.